an awful lot of the people in this country are really happy about this kind of authoritarianism. They don't see it as a necessary evil. They see it as the way the world had, should always have worked. And I find that terrifying. This week's special with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments, 2021 Type 2 American Silver Eagles for only $7.25 over spot. Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We have a returning guest we're always delighted to have, and we never get him as often as we would like, except we had him twice just now, recently, which is a great treat for us. Thank you, John Rubino. He's the founder of DollarCollapse.com for coming back on Liberty and Finance this Friday, September 10th, 2021. Delegate, good to talk to you again. When we've had you on in the past, we've almost exclusively focused on financial topics. I mean, you're the founder of DollarCollapse.com and you co-wrote the Money Bubble, I believe, with James Turk and so on. But um, we wanted to talk with you, if we could today, about a set of topics that have been pressing to the fore. It's ironic because we found that our channel back in 2013 named Reluctant Preppers talking about encroachments on on our freedoms, our liberties, and uh, the need for preparedness in the face of all kinds of different existential risks that could present themselves. In fact, when we saw you speak at the Liberty Mastermind Symposium, I believe that might have been Dallas, Texas, like 2011 or 12 time frame, you were talking about there's any number of things that could go potentially wrong and any of them could end quite badly. And you went through a whole litany of different uh, types of risks, uh, not, not just restricted to the financial sphere. We wanted to, with your help, to talk about what would be the most pressing an example uh, of clear and present dangers to people's freedoms, to our liberties, and to truthfulness of what we're being told about what's really going on. So I guess you just recently uh, wrote an article, in fact, I think it just came out today, called Charts for a Crazy World. If you wanted to start uh, using that as a springboard, and we can get into these topics uh, related to our rights and our freedoms and truth. Well, yeah, as you and I have talked about many times, when a country screws up its finances, uh, then its politics are screwed up by implication and the government starts lying and nobody trusts them anymore. And it's kind of this downward slope until you just fall off a cliff of, of mistrust and inflation and, and uh, authoritarianism. And we are headed that way fast lately. I, you know, it's been it's been kind of a, a creeping process. I, I have a series on dollar collapse called Creeping Fascism. And uh, the next one to come out is going to be uh, creeping fascism is no longer creeping because um, the, the, the government, not just in the U.S., but around the world, governments are doing things that we would normally associate with, you know, banana republic dictatorships or um, Soviet Union style di dictatorships, or, you know, uh, totalitarian countries, stuff like that. And, and it, you know, it's happening in, in part because we screwed up our finances and you would normally expect a broke country to start lying to its citizens and then trying to drain away what little wealth is left in order to keep the guys in power in power. Um, but now we've got all these, uh, well, the, the pandemic is the best example of, of something that comes along and um, terrifies the easily scared to the point that they'll basically believe anything. And then, you know, if you look at the stats now on um, the, on the COVID-19 pandemic, um, Countries around the world are going back into lockdown. We're in danger of shutting down our economies again for a second year over something where the statistics don't even make it look like a crisis anymore. The, the CDC itself has a um, what they call a COVID death tracker, which um, allows you to play around with stats a little bit and pull up charts um, showing the, uh, the impact of um, COVID-19 on people's lives. And they've got one that uh, allows you to break it down by age. So different age groups have different lines on a chart, and they all kind of go up together and down together, the, with the difference being that uh, at this point now, the only ones that are even visible on the chart are for people over 65 and over 75. Everything else is down at zero. So, and, and even the 65 and 70-year-old chart lines are not very serious. You know, they're, they're not the leading killer in the country by any means. Um, and yet, we're going to um, force 
pretty much everybody who works for the government or for a government contractor to get a vaccination, whether they want to or not, you know, whether they trust big pharma to be doing this in an honest way and, and whether they're willing to overlook all the, um, um, the, the side effects of the, uh, the vaccines themselves, it doesn't matter. The government's going to force us to do that. And we're not even the worst offenders. Look at um, Australia. <laughs> if you want to see a, a portrait of a, a formerly free country um, descending into authoritarian chaos, and Australia is not alone. A lot of other countries are doing things almost as crazy. Yeah, let me just let me just interject at that moment. Australian economist John Adams has been on our show as a regular approximately once a month. We have not been able to schedule an interview with him at this time, even though what you're saying is happening there and it's so severe because he, in order for us to do tapings with him, he needs to travel to Sydney. He's under basically house arrest because not he, not because of any, he's never gotten a, a positive COVID test or anything. It's because somebody reported that he was a, a near contact or something like that. And therefore he was told that because of contact tracing, he was officially under stay at home orders. And he had been visited his, at his residence by, men, by members of the police force just to make sure that he and his family are, are obeying and staying at home. So he's under house arrest and lockdown uh, just because he got a phone call from the Ministry of Health of New South Wales saying you have to be. So he can't travel to where we do uh, interviews from his residence. So that's why we haven't had him on talking about the situation on the ground. But we will as soon as he can get out of his house. But that's an example of it. We can't talk about the lockdown because he's locked down. Okay, well, two things about that. One is that... Um, if he's reasonably young and healthy, it's probably more dangerous for him to drive to Sydney in, in city traffic than, than it is to run around unvaccinated and unmasked in Sydney. You know, it's just the, the risk, um, the potential for harm for different things in life are so skewed now in our perception that, uh, that, that it's, it's just amazing the, uh, the risks that we'll put up with versus the ones that we're willing to endure lockdowns over. Australia was one of the freest countries in the world very recently. And now the, um, the president, or you know, whatever the guy in charge of Australia is called, the premier or the president, is talking about a two-tier economy that, uh, where the real economy is run by vaccinated people, for vaccinated people, and the unvaxxed are locked out of it. That's his word, locked out. So they're creating basically a, a two-tiered uh, society now with haves and have-nots in terms of uh, basic freedoms. You know, there's no longer, well, they don't have a, a, a constitution that gives them a bill of rights the way the U.S. does. Not that it's doing us all that much good here to have, have it written down. Uh, so they're not actually violating any kind of um, hard and fast rule in Australia, but they are you know, depriving people of what we would consider to be basic human rights over a medical procedure, which is generally supposed to be private in the first place. So it's an invasion of privacy and it's a uh, abrogation of uh, basic rights. And, um, you know, it's, they're getting away with it uh, because they've been able to scare, let's say, 51 percent of the people, enough people to stay in power. And because they're able to stay in power doing what they're doing, they're going to continue to do it. It's very scary. Now, OK, here, here's the optimistic twist on this. So, um, for instance, in the U.S., there are a lot of people who are rebelling against this, and they tend to be concentrated in states with Republican governors. And I, I think it's a fairly safe bet based on history that uh, the, the Democrats lose at least one legislative branch of the government or one, one House of the legislature in the midterm election. So they'll lose the House or they'll lose the Senate, which will basically hamstring the government. You know, we'll have gridlock at that point. And then two years later, there's a pretty good chance that um, Florida's governor, Ron DeSantis, ends up being president, just because uh, right now he seems to be a, a smart, decisive guy who's doing what an awful lot of people wish their own governors would do. And so the optimistic scenario for the U.S. is that we come out of this politically. And I, this is not to say that Republicans are um, are going to do well at most things because they're, you know, as much big government um, debt addicted politicians as anybody else. Uh, but I, I think they will probably scale back some of the, the true craziness of the COVID thing here so that uh, we'll look back on this year as being as bad as it gets and that we will have turned the corner in a year and a half and maybe be you know, out in the clear in a couple of years. 
Um, and um, we'll just look back on this as, as, as an aberration. I think that's the optimistic scenario, but I think it's, it's po- politically possible going forward. Let's hold on. Let's hold on to that thought just for a moment, because that whole optimistic scenario, and I don't mind having optimistic scenarios, I really don't, is based on the premise of election results. Why should we have confidence that any election results going forward are going to re- are going to reflect the will of the people? That is actually a really good question, and it's a very big deal now because, uh, see, we have to remember that um, the, the two major parties have always stolen votes in various ways. And, you know, go back and uh, read a biography of LBJ, and a big part of his early career ba- was based on on really blatant election manipulation. That was the Democrats, although a lot of those guys are Republicans now. And then the the Republicans do their vote stealing via. Um, um, minimizing the vote. You know, they'll, they'll try to keep people away from the polls who tend to vote Democrat. Um, so we've always had kind of a battle between different methods of cheating in our elections. And the Democrats seem to have ramped it up to a new level lately. And the question becomes, can they continue to get away with it, which with all the, um, the, the public um, observation that is on them now, and um, if they can't, then it goes back to the lower level of cheating that we were kind of used to for all these years. And um, or will the Republicans step up their cheating? You know, so we're, we're in banana republic territory. I will grant you that where um, sometimes the winner of the election is the one that cheated most effectively. Um, and we, we can't put anything past anybody right now. But to the extent that votes still matter, and they, they do to an extent, I mean, you know, we're all going to go out and vote. And hopefully most of our votes are counted. Uh, I, I think history says that um, we, we get a divided government after the midterm elections and that um, there's a good chance with the number of people who, as annoyed as they are, that we get a regime change here via the electoral process. Now, you're right, it could be stolen, but uh, it's going to be a lot harder to do this time around just because we're all watching. You know, we, I think um, a lot of people got caught off guard last time around because they were expecting the normal amount of cheating and they got a lot more. So um, next time around, it'll be harder, uh, especially with some states, at least, passing election integrity laws with things like voter ID and stuff like that, that uh, that will make it somewhat harder to cheat than it has been. But yeah, you know. OK, you brought up voter ID. What do you make as back in the idea of liberty, freedom, truth of the uh, cognitive dissonance that gets going on in my mind of pressures for or against voter ID, calling it, in one case, a renewal of Jim Crow and a, a racist, a regressive policy, that sort of thing, versus saying the same, in the same breath, the same people saying, you've got to have vaccine passports to function in society, otherwise you're part of this class, this underclass of the unvaxxed, which are the real problem in society. Yeah, I, well, I, whoever you talk to is basically talking their book politically. In other words, they're for what gets them more votes and they're against what loses votes. So there, there, there's very little um, moral consistency in our world today. So, yeah, the Democrats hate voter ID laws because it uh, it stops, for instance, undocumented um, immigrants from being able to vote. Um, and the Republicans like it, not necessarily because they're all about integrity, but because it, uh, it limits the number of voters um, who would be voting against the Republicans in any event. The the overriding theme here is that um, we are becoming an authoritarian country in a lot of ways. And I think the the whole vaccine passport thing is just astounding, you know, that uh, that we're going to have to carry our medical records around with us to show to the authorities if we want to eat in a restaurant is is shocking and amazing. And it's not in any way the same thing as showing your driver's license to vote. Those are two completely different things. But like you said, they kind of get lumped together in the argument. You know, I, even though I think that Republicans do what a lot of a lot of what they do in terms of election law with the idea of uh, of gaining a political advantage, I definitely tend to agree that you should show an ID before you vote. I mean, that's one of the most basic common sense ideas imaginable in the, in the political sphere. I mean, you show an ID to do everything. You, know, you can't fly. You can't um, check into a motel. In a lot of places, you can't cash checks. 
without showing an ID. So the idea that there's this huge class of people without IDs um, that will be frozen out of the, um, the, the the political system is probably silly, you know? Um, did I answer your question, Donovan, or did I skirt it? I think so. Um, the, the, what I was looking at was this was this apparent contradiction. I'm not I'm not equivalencing those two things. I'm just saying it seems that if the if the moral high ground that's being claimed by those resisting voter IDs is that you shouldn't be regressively constricting people's ability to do things based on an ID, but then the same breath say, but you should have an ID to be able to go to grocery shopping or go to church or go to anything else. Well, yeah. And, but the point is that there, there really isn't an actual moral high ground in a lot of cases here. It's basically political advantage. So these guys are, they're, they're lawyering um, the system. Well, a lot of people are picking up on that. It's not being missed on the ordinary common sense folks. I interrupted you a long time ago. You were on your way to wrapping up this this, this optimistic case saying we may have a regime change coming. And that was uh, part of your, your overall response to uh, what's going on with the, the, the manipulation of the people and the, and the lack of truthfulness. If you can uh, proceed where, where, I, where I interrupted. Well, you know, by, by bringing up an optimistic scenario, um, I think it's really important in both finance and in politics to keep in mind that uh, just because things are messy right now, that the world might not end. You know, there might be a way out of this because otherwise, you, you know, it, it's really easy to get very dark and very depressed when you're looking at, at what's going on in the world. Uh, but if you think, OK, well, my gold and silver can go way up, I'll actually make money if there's a currency crisis. And the political system is to an extent self-correcting. You know, when when one group gains too much power and starts abusing that power, um, we have a chance to have the pendulum swing back the other way by voting them out of office. That's all still possibly true. You know, it's not a guarantee or anything, but uh, but I think it really helps psychologically when you're looking at this this really dark world that is potentially spinning out of control uh, to keep in mind that it, it's still fixable. You know, this can still be saved from here via the what's left of the political process. And and so don't descend into depression and, uh, and, and just give up, you know, keep working for the things that you value out there. So that was the point I was making. Well, one, OK, let's take it. Let's take that one step further, because uh, a lot of people are sensing. I remember we interviewed G. Edward Griffin. He was actually the first guest ever on our program back in 2013. And he talks about the right and the left, left wing, right wing, as being two wings on the same dirty bird of collectivism. And he says they'll, they'll, talk, they'll talk to different uh, aspects of things that are attractive. One saying, we're going to give you a bunch of stuff and we're going to stand up, make sure no one's left behind. Da, da, da. And the other one saying, uh, we're going to make sure that, that you get uh, reduced burden of taxes or, or reduced encroachments on your freedom. But actually what happens if you just look, no matter which quote unquote party, or whichever wing or whatever is in, is government gets bigger, debting gets bigger, uh, the rights of the individual and the distance that we are from our from our constitutional you know rights it just keeps getting farther and farther and farther away. We, we never repealed the Patriot Act. We never you know repealed all these things, the, the federal income tax on and on. So... Um, what when you said <laughs> when you said uh, if things get bad enough we might get a change from the, the from the group that's being um, that that's uh, in power uh, many people are taking the view that it's not just this political party or that political party that's taking power but that it's the elite versus the common people and if the common people who actually have intrinsic you know God given rights uh, that need to take power then you hear quotes like. You know, uh, freedom was never won through negotiation. It's won through resistance and so on. So isn't opting out or isn't resisting rather than just being optimistic that the other team will get voted in and that'll solve our problems. Another avenue here that, that we haven't addressed. Oh, yeah. You should never assume that um, your team is going to come in and fix everything because that's not how the world works at the moment. I was talking specifically about the COVID thing that. Um, you know, governors of states that have been open can run for president and have a decent chance of becoming president because they're they're going to end up being popular in their state. And a lot of people are going to be wishing they had that guy as their governor. So it's an easy leap from there to want him as the president. In fact, in fact, that's another aspect I thought you were going to say there is that the number of votes and the number of seats in the in Congress that those states uh, control is increasing. 
uh, proportionally because you're getting this mass exodus out of states which have been restrictive of people's freedoms and flowing into states which have been uh, liberty loving. Now, we, we have to see what that process looks like, though, because if, if a bunch of Californians move to Texas, but vote like Californians, then Texas having an extra congressional seat doesn't necessarily buy that side, you know, the conservative side of the, uh, the political spectrum much. <laughs> but on the other hand, if it's the, the people who understand what they're leaving, who move out of California and go somewhere else and are going to vote accordingly, then, then yes, it, it helps a lot that the, uh, the states like Florida and Texas that are picking up congressional seats are growing the way they are. You know, that's, a, that, that's definitely a positive uh, for certain aspects of the freedom agenda, not, not the whole thing. Because like you said, the, uh, the Republicans and Democrats are both part of one big organization that has as its main goal the accumulation of power. You know, we basically have an aristocracy right now. And the, the idea that that aristocracy is going to suddenly, because some new guy gets in charge of you know, some branch of the government, it is suddenly going to turn around and become this, um, you know, this force for libertarianism, you know, of, of, for force for human freedom. That's unlikely. You know, it's going to have to happen in a much messier way. I, I suspect we get a, you know, a gigantic collapse. And in the chaos of that collapse, we, we have a conversation about what we want to rebuild from the rubble, and then we have an argument between the different visions. And then there's a chance that, um, that the people that you and I, Dunnigan, would, would consider the, uh, the most fit to rule, you know, the people who are in favor of individual freedom and limited government and sound money, there's a chance that they win. Uh, but the process of getting from here to there is going to be incredibly messy. And it, it really hasn't even started yet. You know, as long as the government can create money out of thin air, it can elevate this system for at least a while longer. It can, in other words, it can fool us into thinking that everything's OK. Um, eventually that blows up on them because you cannot um, take on more and more debt year after year after year. You know, you can't have exponential growth in a finite system, basically. I interrupted you way back in the beginning. And I think you were on your way to talking about this article that you wrote, which also addresses truth. And the you just mentioned about uh, dishonest money and how that can be used to float a system. So how is dishonest uh, narrative also used to float a system? And then how are we experiencing that today that's provable? Okay, well, on the finance side, um, you know, we're creating unlimited amounts of money, basically, and dumping it into the system. And we're, we're generating, by doing that, some headline numbers that are actually pretty good. You know, we've got GDP growth of three-ish percent, which is kind of normal. And, and inflation is up some, but uh, you can make the case that that's because the economy is growing quickly and everything. And, and lots of other headline indicators, like unemployment, which is five percent according to the government's main um, indicator uh, those look like good numbers but under the surface when you look at what you have to pay in terms of newly created debt and money creation to get those headline numbers things are actually deteriorating very quickly but they're they're kind of lying to us about it so we don't see that but uh, if you look at any any sector in the u.s you know consumers or small businesses or students or whatever they are all taking on more and more debt year after year after year, and it's become unsustainable in most cases. So we're, we're building a society that's primed for a collapse on the financial side. Uh, while the government is telling us these numbers look great, you know, we're actually a pretty healthy country. And, and I think people are starting to get that now that inflation is picking up, people are starting to realize in their own lives, their own lived experience, that things aren't as good as they're being told because the price of everything they're trying to buy is going through the roof. You know, if you're, if you're trying to buy a car right now, you know things aren't right. Or if you're trying to build a house and the cost of every appliance, and you know, we're putting in a chain link fence at our house. And um, the, the price of iron ore has tripled in the last year or two, which means the price of steel for a fence is way up. So, so we're experiencing inflation firsthand, and that changes your perception of the world. So that, that is starting to happen. Now, on, on the, the political side, obviously, the, the COVID thing is just shocking to a lot of people. That we've, we've taken this thing that is you know, serious, it should be dealt with in a serious way, but we've turned it into this national crisis that's dividing us basically along similar lines 
um, as during the Trump presidency. You know, it's basically the same people. The pro-vax guys were the anti-Trumpers and the, the anti-vax guys were the, the ones who were pro-Trump. And, and so somehow we've maintained this political division, which seemed like an aberration uh, for another few years. And the, the people who are being disadvantaged by the whole COVID thing are getting more and more frustrated, it seems. I mean, that's my, my sense is that people are getting angrier and angrier and more and more willing to start with, um, uh, you know, just, just refusing orders and then moving on from there. You know, to go back to Australia, they're, they're having these street battles between middle-aged people who you would no not normally see, see protesting violently and the police were wading in with clubs and tear gas and stuff over vaccine or um, yeah, vaccine passports and um, virus lockdowns. Um, there's no reason why that won't end up happening here if this continues. So, you know, I, I wouldn't call this in any way a good thing, the whole pandemic lockdown thing, but the one small bright light there is that it's uh, it, it's illustrating to a lot of people uh, that they're being lied to kind of across the board. And, and the uh, the pandemic thing has, is what has forced them to take a good hard look at what kind of a government we have now, what kind of a people we've become. And, and uh, maybe that clarity is going to lead to some positive things. We have to hope. Interesting. Yeah, the, the, uh, it, it has certainly occurred to me over the last week or so when we've had official announcements either from the president or the, or the president's press secretary or others talking about this is what's coming, this is what the six-step plan is, we're going to move forward with these things, that it's, people are waking up to the fact that their freedom is, is basically at the whim of those in power, it, that they, they are seeing their constitutional expectations of due process, balance of powers, intrinsic rights, that sort of thing, just being pushed aside. That's causing, I believe, what Jim Rawls refers to as the era of betrayed trust, because people have placed their trust, as you point out, not just in the political process and in their government itself and their, and their leaders and that sort of thing, in many, many, many aspects of our lives. And if they think, wait a minute, if you've betrayed my trust in this area, where else have you betrayed my trust? And so you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, that that awakening on people's parts may be a healthy thing if we've been sleepwalking for some time. Are there specific examples that you would either you have seen or are expecting we will see of people's uh, increased uh, uh, weariness or, or lack of just blanket trust in in government uh, that would be a healthy thing? Or do you think it's just, again, going to fall upon these these lines that divide, you know, Camp A and Camp B, and it's all going to depend on which team is in, is occupying the uh, the White House as far as whether people think that uh, they, they trust the government or they don't. You know, I think the the government in the U.S. has been so dishonest for so long that I, it's going to be very hard for anybody to get um, full trust back from most people. And I think a lot of what the the whole unvaccinated minority thing is in the U.S. is basically civil disobedience. It's people who just do not trust the system. And so they're not going to do this thing they're being ordered to do. You know, it's not any kind of deep knowledge about um, how vaccines work or the, uh, the specific mathematical risks of getting vaccinated. They're just not willing to trust the guys in charge. And, you know, there's a concept of the trust horizon that comes into play here, um, which is basically the the scope of the people and institutions that you as an individual are willing to trust. And in good times, when the country feels well run, you tend to trust the big systems that are far away, you know, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department and, and the military and Congress. You, you think they're all doing a pretty good job and you're willing to take your cues from them and kind of allow them to take care of you in a lot of ways. But when they start screwing up, and lying as they have been for at least 20 years and probably a lot longer. Um, you stop trusting those big systems and maybe you trust the governor of your state for a while or the state legislature or the, you know, the institutions of your state. And when they start messing up the way a lot of states are, your trust horizon moves back to your community and then from there to your family. So then we become very tribal when that's happening. You know, you just don't want to trust that many people. Uh, and you only trust the people you can see, look in the eye, shake hands with, and who's maybe even whose families, you know. That's a really dysfunctional way to be for a country. 
but it's what happens when governments screw up on the scale that ours are screwing up, you know? So we're, we're seeing that happen where people who used to think that, uh, you know, JP Morgan Chase uh, was basically okay. And, and uh, the federal reserve was looking out for us. Well, now they don't think that at all. You know, they're, they're all the way back to buying their food at the farmer's market and spending most of their time with their friends and family. And, uh, um, you know, it's hard to get back to what we would consider to be a normal modern system after that level of loss and of, of a loss of trust. So, you know, I don't know how it happens from here to there. It's going to take a lot of really honest um, people running the political system for quite a while before trust comes back. And uh, in the meantime, um, again, to look on the bright side of this. We start living like we should have all along, you know, because we, we should have always been focused on our family and our community and uh, and not expecting these big distant systems to take care of us. So, you know, if you if, if this process has led someone to go out and buy some farmland and learn how to grow food on it and how to integrate themselves into their community by volunteering or whatever, uh, then it's a really good thing. You know, then we end up healthier for all that. But uh, it, it still is very hard to get back to what we would consider a, you know, modern globalized economy that might not happen in our lifetimes. You know, this whole idea of quote unquote, getting back to normal has been just uh, nagging at me for, for quite some time for a couple different reasons. One gets back to the honesty, dishonesty discussion we were having before, because from on high, we're being told, if only you will uh, surrender, forgo, forget about this particular constitutional right, you know, <laughs> constitutionally protected in tr natural right that you have, uh, and just comply with this emergency situation, then we can get back to normal. And then what we reserve the right to redefine what complying means, you know, people who said, if only you could, people would wear a mask or get, get vaccinated, then we can get back to normal. Then what well, they redefined, well, wearing masks meant double masking or vaccinated. Now Israel is officially redefined fully vaccinated instead of two vaccines. Now it's three vaccines. So it reminds me of when uh, uh, head of the uh, Federal Reserve was recently asked, would they be able to honor Social Security payments in the future? The answer was, we'll certainly honor the terms of what people are expecting, but the value of those funds in which they're paid, may, we're not going to guarantee that. So the idea of moving the goalpost saying, if only you comply, everything will get back to normal. Well, for one thing, that's abnormal because you shouldn't have to do something abnormal in order to be treated normally. That's that's the definition of, I guess, uh, it's not normal. Uh, but we're being told that's the new normal is that you get uh, your freedom, your intrinsic rights not taken away from you as long as you do whatever we tell you to do. And we're going to change the definition of that. So that's one. But the other is the, you talked about that fear narrative that's used to then voluntarily evoke compliance from the part of people. And there's a saying that I heard more than once recently that you think you're going to comply because things will get back to normal, but things will never get back to normal because you complied. Uh, what's your, what's your perspective on, uh, this notion of needing to comply in order to quote unquote, be free. Isn't that itself a contradiction? Uh, and also this idea that if you do comply, you're just perpetuating uh, that situation. Oh, yeah, it's a huge contradiction that we're giving up our freedoms in order to protect freedom. But that's, you know what, that's how authoritarian governments have always worked it. So, so two things there. One is that um, it feels like about 40% of the population totally understands what you just said, right? And they've become totally disillusioned with the government. But the terrifying part of this is that maybe, I, you know, I'm, I'm guessing about these numbers, but it feels like 60% of the population loves it. They love having a government impose its will on people who disagree with them. So, so it's like they're, um, you know, uh, they've always been closet, closet sociopaths, but they had to hide it because it wasn't socially acceptable. And it's finally become socially acceptable because the government is doing their bidding for them. And that's what really scares me, you know, which is basically what you see anytime a dictator takes over in a country. It, it, it turns out that he has no shortage of prison guards and secret policemen, right? They, they find it very easy to recruit people to implement authoritarianism. And it's the, the implication of that is that uh, people have always been like that, but they're just in a, a well-run society. 
they have to keep that side of themselves under control. But as soon as they're allowed to let it out, it, it just runs free. And that's what it feels like in, in today's argument over vaccine passports and stuff like that, that like, you know, an awful lot of the people in this country are really happy about this kind of authoritarianism. They don't see it as a necessary evil. They see it as the way the world had, should always have worked. And I find that terrifying. If we could indulge ourselves in one economic adventure here, uh, we have a question from Belly Dance Rabia R who says, will we still be able to buy gold and silver when they force the central bank digital currency CBDC on us? It's a predict, it's a predicting the future, but what do you look at when you see that? Well, you shouldn't be thinking, will we still be able to buy gold and silver a as a question ab about any of the stuff that might be coming? Because the answer, it, first of all, it's indeterminate. You know, we don't know when we won't be able to buy gold and silver anymore, but at some point we won't. And it'll be because probably because something fairly serious happened, like maybe the introduction of a central bank digital currency, you know, because you know what they're going to do with that is uh, you won't have cash and they'll be able to manipulate your bank account in various ways to control your consumer behavior or your political behavior. And that's a huge deal. It may not be recognized as such when it happens, uh, because most people don't think of money in that way. But uh, that, that is the way it will. That's what it really will be when the time comes. Uh, but, you know, there will come a time when you want gold and silver if you haven't gotten any yet and you won't be able to get it. So the solution to that is to get some now, you know, get it while you can, because it. As Jim Rickards likes to say, you know, he has clients that come to him and say, OK, right before the crash happens, let me know and then I'll go out and buy my gold and silver. And and, uh, and he responds, well, by the time we see it coming, you know, when I can tell you it's imminent, you won't be able to get anything that you want. You know, so you have to get it now and just hold it um, and just put up with whatever happens between now and then in terms of the price of gold and silver, uh, because you will be very glad that you have it when it's unavailable to everybody else. Uh, when that's going to be, you know, in terms of what day it's going to happen, I have no idea. But you, you know, we're headed that way with all this stuff that we just talked about going on. You know, I have to give people a specific example that mirrors exactly what you just said. And that was last fall when we heard that uh, there was going to be actually it was last year earlier when uh, President Trump uh, actually declared a national emergency and it caused a whole bunch of people to have to try to scramble to the stores and we the stores ran out of you know non-perishable food and toilet paper and everything else uh, immediately we had been given a tip that morning early that uh, hollywood was shutting down because trump was going to announce what they called a national quarantine so we put out this hot news flash saying hey national quarantine may be announced this afternoon from a inside source that's that's proven reliable and please go out and get what you need now if you haven't already. We've been encouraging people since 2013 to stock up on stuff. But if you haven't, this would be your last chance. And we actually caught flack from people saying you were wrong. It wasn't a national quarantine. It was just a national emergency. And so you were wrong. And it's like you missed the point. So anyway, just um, your message that I'm hearing is uh, wait in the don't wait. Don't wait for the storm to be obvious by the time it's obvious. It will have been obvious to others than yourself, and there won't be anything to be had. So um, your top one or two or three preparedness tips that you think everyone should consider doing if they haven't already? Well, obviously, gold and silver is always going to be at the top because that if you go, go back through 3000 years of human history and they were the things that got people through crises of any kind. So um, switch your finances over from um fiat currencies and the things that depend on them for their value to real assets that you um, that, that, that nobody else has to keep a promise to um, make them hold their value. Um, and then, you know, look at the other aspects of your life um, in terms of how you're going to get by if you really can't trust the big systems anymore. So if you, um, you know, if you've got a little garden space and you can grow part of your own food, that's a big deal right there because we've seen what happened in um as you were saying when when there were shortages of a lot of stuff back in 2020 um you couldn't just go out and buy what you wanted anymore well that's that's liable to be a kind of sort of new normal for a while as supply chains stay screwed up um so being able to produce some of your own food is uh, is a very big deal and then get involved in your 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 community because you, you can't get through hard times alone necessarily. And it, it's 
immeasurably better to do it if people have your back and you have their back and you're you know you're a community that is taking care of each other uh, which all of that stuff right is it, just basic common sense we should have been doing it all along and and uh, and now maybe the imminence of the um the disruptions that are probably coming um will, will spur more people to start living that way and uh you know, I think it's a healthy thing as far as it goes. In other words, even if there isn't some gigantic financial crisis or gigantic political crisis out there, we're still better off if we've done the things I just mentioned. And, uh, you know, there are a few other things, but start with those. And, and, uh, and once you've completed them, then go on from there. We've been speaking with John Rubino, founder of dollarclaps.com. John, we're going to put a link to your recent article that we springboarded off of at the beginning of this in the description of this video. So folks are going to want to read that. Where can people get plugged in for all the rest of your work, John? Well, dollarclaps.com is where I pretty much do everything these days. So come on over and there's a, um, a link at the top of the page that allows you to sign up for the email list. Just put your email address there and then I'll send you whatever I publish for free. Speaking of emails, folks, we've got over 60,000 and growing subscribers on YouTube and only a little over 2,000 subscribers to our free, 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 that I mentioned free newsletter. So make sure you go to libertyandfinance.com and over on the left-hand margin, put your name and email address, click submit and confirm it when you get a confirmation email and you're in. You'll get all of our guests, including every interview we do, we do with John Robino and all of our other guests and any links that they provide us will be in there as well. So you don't have to go searching for those things. John, thanks for joining us again here on Liberty and Finance. Thanks, Doug. This week's special with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments. 2021 Type 2 American Silver Eagles for only $7.25 over spot. Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.